be starting a series here. And what I want to do is I want to take us through the Apostles' Creed. It's the simplest expression of the basics of the Christian faith. And it's good to know what we believe, isn't it? And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking it a clause by a clause and we're going to be preaching on a different passage each time that explains it. But as part of what I want to do, I want to have us all say the Apostles' Creed together. So I think Ty's got the words there for us. Awesome. So if you would all rise with me, we're going to say the Apostles' Creed together. And if you don't know it, read along. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. By the way, in case you didn't know, I had a lady one time as I was teaching Sunday school I was telling them that Catholic means universal. So Catholic means every single Christian all over the world. When I say I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, I'm not saying I, I believe the Roman Catholic Church is, is the only right church. What I'm saying is I believe that wherever on earth there are Christians, they are part of the one church of God. So she said, oh, I haven't ever said that part of the creed because I was worried that I was saying something that wasn't true. So just in case that's you, that's what it means. But today we're going to focus on this basic starting point. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And have you ever, pardon me, heard the saying, my house, my rules? I kind of like that saying. I, I knew people, well, a few times this has happened now, but I knew some people, they had this kid that just would not behave. He was a holy terror. And they would come to my house and he would be doing things that I did not approve of with my house. And they would say, well, what do you do? We can, we've tried. We can't do anything. And one day I went, you know what? My house, my rules. And so I said to him, stop that. And he stopped. <laughs> it was quite enjoyable. And that's been my rule ever since. My house, my rules. You want to bring your kids over? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If they start acting like a terror, they're going to learn that in Matthew's house, you behave Matthew's way. And it's very entertaining. We all like to be in charge, don't we? We all like to set the standards to make the rules. But the question becomes, who's in charge of the world? This is an especially important question these days, right? Is it the government that's in charge? Do they have the power and the authority? Do they get to decide what is right and what is wrong? Is it rich people? I mean, they seem to have a lot of power. They've got the cash. They can make the rules, right? How does that go? You've got the money, I've got the time, I think is how the song goes. Or maybe it's me. Pick me. Maybe I can be the captain of my own soul. We're taught by the world that we get to choose not only uh, how we live or what job we have, but we're taught that we can choose what we believe. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Have you heard that one? Well, you believe whatever you want. And I'm going to believe what I want. And I'll see how it works out. And that's the way we live, isn't it? We're in charge. And we like to be in charge. We're the boss. We've got the faith in ourselves. But is this true? Well, thankfully, come to Genesis 1 with me. Right to the start of of the story and we'll see what God says and it begins in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering 
over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Just a side note, in Hebrew, I love this. I don't usually get into language stuff, but here's how it is in Hebrew. Erev, Boker, Yom Echad. Evening, morning, day one. Evening, morning, day two. Very simple, very clear, very clean, very straightforward. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and also the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day and God said let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God said and saw that it was good. This is where we start. In the beginning, God, before anything was created, before there was anything else, God was. God's name that he reveals himself as is I am, because there is no was with God and there is no will be. God is always, has always been, will always be, and for him, universe, time, everything is a created thing before anything God in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth there is nothing apart from God you know in in the back of our minds we kind of think that there maybe was something alongside God maybe there was you know, the beginning part where God was working with something. Sometimes we can forget that there was a time when even time wasn't there. But God made everything, not just this earth, not just fashioned it or crafted it, but God indeed made all that there is. Have you ever heard of the Big Bang Theory? It's a fantastic theory. Think of what it says. At one point there was nothing. And then something really dramatic happened, and all the universe appeared. 
and God said something. Yeah, that's very consistent. The only thing they've got wrong is timing. God spoke, and from utter nothing, all that is and all that will be and all that was appeared, including time. Doesn't that just give you a little bit of goosebumps? God spoke, and this happened. This is the power of the God we serve. His word is able to create all things just like that. But God took his time. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say, how, how could God have done all of that in six days? Create the world, create the universe, create the rivers and the seas, create all the creatures and everything. How could God possibly have done it in such a short time? He took his sweet time. You know that? He deliberately fashioned the world day by day because he wanted to help us to understand how much he cares for this world and every little thing. He could have just said, let there be everything. And there would be. And it would have all worked out according to his plan, according to his mind. Everything in its place. But God deliberately chose to show the care that he has for this world by taking six days, by spending time, by focusing in on one detail after the next and showing just how valuable it was. God cares about his creation. And Genesis 1 already shows us just how much. God wasn't doing this because he had to. You know, there's some arguments that say, well, you know, God had something that he needed, something that he was missing, and so he created the world to fill that gap. No. You want to know why God created? It says so in the scriptures, to glorify himself. He's showing off. And right from the beginning, that's always been the focus. Look what God can do, because God chooses to do so. God created everything and took his time. He fashioned it on purpose, and there were no accidents. Every step of the way, what does it say? God looked at it and said, it's good. He didn't look at it and say, well, gee, I could have done better, but this will have to do. You ever done that? I, I, I do carpentry stuff, and sometimes I'll look at it and I'll say, good enough, <laughs> right? You know, if you're framing a wall, I used to have a terrible problem because I would want to do everything finish level, perfect. But with framing, you slam it together and you say, good enough, because guess what? No one's going to see it. As long as it does its job and holds things up, who cares how perfect it is? That always was difficult for me because I want it to be perfect. But when God created the earth, he created a masterpiece, perfect to the smallest detail. We've been studying the world for years now, humans have, right? And every time you look closer, what do you find? Some new little thing that you didn't see before that is just amazing. Have you ever seen that Blue Planet show and Planet Earth that the BBC did? And they just take a camera and wander around the world and see stuff. And it blows your mind. All of these little things tucked out of the way. The one guy to get the video, he had to sit in this little stone hut with a camera for over a month to catch a snow leopard and record it out of the way where no one would see it on their day-to-day -day journey and yet it's there. Why? Because God's showing off. Because God's glorifying himself in every aspect of the world and God says it's good and I built it on purpose. So this is the key or the first key here. God built this world. God meant it, and he did so with care and purpose. He meant everything to be the way it is with no accidents, and he knew all that was going to happen to this world. And then it gets good, because on the sixth day, he did something else, something different, something unlike everything he'd done before. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. 
And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And then we go down a little bit here to uh, chapter 2, verse 7, and it says, Then God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And then we go down a little bit further to verse 18 of chapter 2. And it says, The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, so I will make him a helper fit for him. And out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heaven, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, this was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God did something amazing. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed up the place with flesh. And that rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is the, at last is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall be one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. God said, let us make man. Let us create a unique being. Up to this point, we've said, let the fish come, let the birds come according to their kind, let the beasts come according to their kind. He spoke a word and it was done. But then God said, I'm going to make someone special. And he personally reached down and he took the dust and he formed the man by hand, handcrafted. And then he breathed his life into that man. And this man came to life special, unique, totally different than any other created being, cared for by God in a way that no one else and nothing else had, given by God his very image, his likeness. We're special and different. We've been given bits of God, the communicable attributes of God, a way to think, a way to know, a way to have relationship and feeling that no other creature can have. And above all, we've been given the capacity, the ability to have a relationship with God. We are unique. And then he went a step further. He didn't just copy the same process, but when he came to make a woman, he did another completely unique thing. He took a rib from Adam and he handcrafted the woman. He spent just as much care and attention on the woman as he did on the man. Why? Because they're both vitally important to God. And he said, let us make man in our image. And he made them male and female. And you know what the awesome thing is? Both of us reflect the image of God a little bit differently. In the image of woman, God has placed aspects of himself. And in the image of man, he's placed aspects of himself. And together, humans reflect the image and the glory of God. And we are built to be in relationship with each other. Doesn't that blow you away just a little bit? God handcrafted you. God didn't just turn on the factory machine and let it run. God didn't just say, well, you know, some will be a little less perfect than others. Well, that one, oh man, I really screwed up on that one, but I guess it's too late now. God handcrafted you. God meant you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not some leftovers that were dragged out and thrown on the line because there was nothing better. 
He made you on purpose and you are infinitely valuable because of that. And every single human life is infinitely valuable because of that. Every one. Now sometimes that's easy for us, right? We look around and we see a child and it seems nice. But then we look at the person that we dislike. Or the person that we have trouble with. Or maybe the person that we think is downright evil. And that person has infinite value and worth because they too were handcrafted by God. We are unique, special, amazing because of what God has done in us to make us. And then he gave us dominion over the earth. He gave us the task, the glory, the work, the job of looking after the earth of being responsible for the earth. He made us his stewards. He said, you guys are in charge in my name. Not just, you guys are in charge, do whatever you want, burn down all the forests and cut up all the, all the trees and burn tires anytime you feel like it and pollute the rivers and destroy the waterways. No, he said, you're my stewards. You have dominion in my name. You are my representatives on this earth. So care for it. He built a beautiful masterpiece and then he said, you guys get the, chat, the opportunity to be my hands and feet in this world and have dominion, have use over it. And then God blessed us. He called us good and he blessed us. He said that this is the way we are supposed to be. He gave us the privilege of being in relationship with him. So God made humans with a purpose, with a plan, as stewards, as reflectors of his image and his glory, and he gave us the task to glorify him. The Westminster Confession of Faith says the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We're here on this earth for him, to glorify him, to lift him up. So often we get the idea that if you just zoomed out the camera far enough, you'd see that truly we are in the center of the universe, right? This earth was built for us. It's ours. And everything's built around us. That's the way we think. But it's not true. This earth was built for the glory of God. You were built to glorify God. Your entire purpose is to glorify God. Now, sometimes that seems like a bad thing because all of a sudden the whole my house, my rules thing is starting to fall apart. All of a sudden, if I'm not the center of the universe, then maybe it's not all about me. Maybe I've got to look elsewhere for purpose. And it says, God rested. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on this day God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God didn't have to rush. God did everything in his time and then God set an example for us of rest. But God didn't just make the world and say have fun. He didn't say sit on your hindquarters he also made some rules God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and the, of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the living things that move on the earth and God said behold I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with a seed in its fruit you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food and it was so. And God saw everything that he'd made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and morning on the sixth day. And he said, or in, and in verse 8 of chapter 2, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree 
that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delam and ox onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the name of the fourth is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God built the world, and then he set the rules. He set the parameters. He said, this is the way it works. You've got a job, humans. Care for the world. Tend the garden. You've got a job, humans. Things that you must do. Be fruitful. Multiply. That's the very first command. Did you know that? Married people. If the Lord grants it, have kids. Why? Jesus said so. Be fruitful. Multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. This earth is for humans and you should. Fill it, subdue it, control it, protect it, look after it, care for it as God would want you to care for it. You're in charge of working it. So work. He made us clever and able to do things so that we could indeed do them. And then he gave the rules, the do's and the don'ts. He placed him in the garden and he placed two trees there, the tree of life. If you eat from this tree, you'll live forever. By the way, that was a tea tree, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and then he placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in it, with fruit that's pleasing to the eye and good to the touch, and in the end it leads to death. And that was the coffee tree, in case you didn't know. <laughs> and he said, this tree is there. This power is there. Don't touch it. Why? Don't eat from it. Because if you do, you'll die. Now, I was telling them in the Sunday school, this, this may seem arbitrary. Have you ever heard that? The rules seem arbitrary. How come God gets to tell me what to do? How come he says something's sin and something's not? Who is he to make the rules? You ever heard that? Ah, oh, it's arbitrary. Okay, here's how it works. God made the world, so he knows what's best and what's worst. Have you ever had a, had a gun? And you go in to learn how to use it. I don't know if you guys did this as a kid, but my grandpa taught me how to use it. And you know what the first thing he did was? He taught me, that's the pointy end with the bullet coming out, pointed away from you and anyone you don't want to hurt. And if I was to say, Grandpa, how dare you? You can't tell me what I should do or not do, I'm going to take that end and I'm going to put it to my shoulder because I know what's better. And then I'm going to pull that trigger and I'll show you what's right and wrong. What would happen to me? When he says you shall surely die if you sin, it's because sin kills you. It's not because he just arbitrarily said, well, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. And if you do those things, I'm going to stomp you. It's that sin kills. Sin is poison. When we try to take to ourselves the job of doing right and wrong, knowing good from evil, living to be a good enough person, it's like taking that rifle, putting the wrong end to our shoulder, and blowing ourselves away. You'll die every time, all the time. You know, when you were a kid and you, you thought there was a bright idea, I'm going to go play in traffic, and mom said, don't. Well, but mom, I want to. Don't. Why? Because she didn't want you to die. Well, mom, that's not fair. That's so mean. How could you? You're not letting me have my freedom. But maybe she cared about you more than you cared about yourself. 
You ever felt that with your parents? I know I did growing up. What? But mom, I want to eat candy for breakfast every morning. Well, Matthew, you can't. You'll get sick. Your teeth will fall out. But mom, I know what's better. And I dreamed of the day. Oh, I was so excited for the day when I could do my own thing. When I'd be a grown-up and I could make my own rules. And guess what I do? Same thing mom taught me to do. Don't eat candy for breakfast. Have a cup of tea. Life. God set the rules because God knows the way that is best. God is not this big, mean killjoy who just wants to ruin everything for us. God cares for us. God cares so much, He was willing to come and to die for us. It matters to Him that we live the full, rich, deep, happy, joyful life that He has for us. And every time we look at Him and we say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I think I'm going to chow down on a bit of poison today. Things go wrong. Relationships shatter. We have sickness. We have sadness. We have all of the evil and all of the terror that's gone on in the world. Because humans keep saying, I will make my own rules, thank you so much. I will be the captain of my soul. I will make my own decisions. And if anyone gets in the way, they better watch out. And death is the only result. Always. We are all rebellious. We all hate God's rules. We're all drawn to sin. I don't know if this thing's working still. Is it working? Can you hear me? Uh -huh. <laughs> I've said a couple times to people, I don't know if I need a microphone some days. <laughs> We're all drawn to be rebellious because we all want to be in charge. We want to put faith in ourselves. We want to believe that we know well enough how to live. We want to believe the truth that I'm the best. I know I do, right? I have never made a wrong decision in my life. People just don't realize my genius. And that's how we feel, isn't it? It couldn't possibly be that I just did the wrong thing. And we make... Ah, my wife's laughing back there. <laughs> we make our own decisions, but God made the world. God's in charge and God knows the way it works. So God created the world. God created us. Therefore, God is the boss. Has that sunk in? This is how it works. God created the world. God created us so He is the boss, period. If I ever have a disagreement with him on the basis of this, at the very beginning, I'm wrong because he built me. When I think I know better than God, I'm wrong because he built the world. When I think that I'm smarter than him, I'm wrong because he is outside of all of this stuff, has been and will be beyond. The God we serve cares about the finest details of the world. He showed this to us. You can take the telescope. I've gone to the observatory just south of by uh, Pritis there. And I've looked into a telescope that showed me 24 light years away. And there's this ring nebula. It's beautiful. Blue. Circular. Looks like a ring. Out there in space. 24 light years away. And you know what's the amazing thing about looking that far into a telescope? There's always something just beyond, just on the edge, because God created so much more than I could ever imagine. That way lies madness, because I want to see. God created the world, and he cared about all those details. If you go down to the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean, you know there's a worm that lives on the volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean? Why is it there? 
but it lives there. It feeds from it. And they took a camera and they went and found this thing. You know, while they were filming that blue planet thing, they discovered something like seven species that no one knew existed before. Because everywhere you turn, God declares his glory in this world. God shows how much he cares. He's not distant or unaware of what's going on. He's close and he's full of care. He cares about the tiniest little thing. As Jesus said, he clothed the grass. He clothed the lilies in all their glory. What do you think he's doing with you? He cares so much. He built each one of us for a purpose. And we're perfect expressions of, crea of his creative glory. We're not a mistake. We're not an accident. We're not an oops. When we look in the mirror and we say, oh, I don't like that about myself. That's part of who God made me to be. Can't remember if I told you guys, or if you've ever noticed, my nose is crooked. And every time I look in the mirror, I think, hmm, I'm a little bit different. And guess what? God meant it that way. And he's glorifying himself through me with my crooked nose. And I can look at that and say, oh, I'm not perfect. Or I can say, thank God I'm me. Because if I'm not me, I won't be me. It's a very simple concept. He makes the rules for life. There is only one way to live correctly on this earth. We must know the one who built us. We must know the one who made the rules. And we must know the one who's called us to live his way. Through sin we've fallen short. But the creator God has set one great rule above all others if you repent of your sins if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ you will be saved this is not a maybe this is not a might this is not if you work hard enough this is the rules given to us by God and God says do this and live that's it that's all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this hope because He gives us the hope. And when we believe, we have the power by the Spirit to live His way, not in our own strength, not by our own efforts, but because He, the Creator, the one who sets the rules, is faithful and true and has made a way for us to walk with Him. When we follow the Creator, we can never go wrong. So do you know your Creator? Do you know Him today? Have you met the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you really understand how much He cares for you? Do you realize that He made you for purpose? And that there's a call on your life? Do you know that he cares about you more than you can care for yourself. Do you know he has a plan for you? And are you ready to surrender to the one who makes the rules? This is the hard part for many of us. We're good with getting saved, but we've got to surrender. We've got to trust that he knows better. We all have those areas where we're resistant to him, where we're holding something back, where we're saying, yeah, 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 I get all those ones, but this thing, I'm pretty sure that this particular poison is so tasty I just can't resist it. Are we ready to give those areas up? God built us to work the best when we're under his control. We're called to surrender to him and obey his commands and then we will live the life that we are meant to live. So I pray today, for each one of us, that we can fully say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator, the Maker of heaven and earth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you so much for what you are doing, for what you have done. I thank you that you love us and you care for us and you give us this wonderful world. And I thank you that you created us on purpose. Grant us a deep understanding of who you are and help us by your spirit to believe in you and to obey 
in Jesus' name. Amen.